Okay, would like to thank everybody and welcome you to our September 19th, 2022 meeting. And as always, we'll uh, start off with our invocation. Ask Commissioner Stoney Gresham to do it. Thank you. Uh, join me if you'd like. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here to do the people's business of Union County. We pray that you would uh, give us wisdom and insight into the decisions we make. And we pray that you'll be with everyone as they go home and keep everyone safe. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> I'm pleased to introduce to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Okay, the first thing on our agenda tonight is a proclamation from PACE, which stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly Month of 2022. And I'm going to call on Miss Alexis Farmer to come forward and speak. Is she here? Is somebody here in her place? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would suggest reading the resolution and then the board taking action on that. Okay. Madam Clerk, could I have the, the resolution? Okay, Pace Month 2022, a proclamation. Whereas September is a is National Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, Pace Month, and whereas Pace Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly is an innovative program that provides high-quality care in the community to older people with chronic needs, and whereas Pace is a fully integrated model that provides social support, medical care, and comprehensive, highly coordinated service while allowing the person to remain at home, avoiding hospital admission or nursing home placement, which allows the older adults who qualify for nursing home level of care to continue living in the community. And whereas individuals enrolled in PACE receive all Medicare and Medicaid covered items and services, as well as additional support which promote well-being and greater independence. And whereas PACE programs assume full financial risk for all medical care and related services, including transportation, hospitalization, and long-term care. In return for cap capitated payments from Medicare and Medicaid, thereby controlling costs for the state while providing improved health outcomes and greater satisfaction for participants. And whereas PACE Month provides an opportunity to increase awareness of PACE and the benefits PACE organizations provide to the community. And whereas the theme of 2022 National PACE Month is PACE, this is the place that highlight stories of PACE staff and participants. Now, therefore, the Union County Board of Commissioners does hereby proclaim September 2022 be PACE Month and invites every resident to join in recognizing PACE Month and celebrate the staff and participants for their role in making PACE a success in Union County, adopted this 19 day of September 2022, and we all signed the form. And I've had both mother-in-law and father-in-law that were able to stay at home, and it really means a lot. And there's a few gray-headed people out there, not that many, but it means a lot to be able to uh, stay at home as long as you can. Thank you very much. 
Okay, Excellence in Design Award for Simpson Event Center. Uh, and I need to recognize Chris Boyd. Chris, before you start, yes. let me do, take care of one bit of housekeeping. Mm -hmm. I was just reminded, uh, I make a motion that we adopt this proclamation. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Vice Chair Williams. Okay. Well, good evening, Commissioners. Um, I'm excited uh, that you give me the opportunity to uh, acknowledge a design award that was received for our new Simpson Event Center. The uh, Simpson Event Center received the 2022 Excellence in Design Award from American Buildings. Um, it goes without saying that it was a vision of this uh, Board of Commissioners, uh, our County Manager, Mark Watson, Assistant County Manager, Patrick Nyland, that made this building into a reality. Um, after you know many years of discussions and planning, finally we got the building, and it's a great building. Um, right now, I want to take the opportunity to bring some of our key uh, team members up uh, to acknowledge their contributions um, and made this project uh, a success, leading the effort from programming to um, through design and all the way through construction to final completion. First, I want to ask Linda Whitaker to come up. Linda served as our project manager and our owner's representative on the project. Um, her leadership and attention to detail uh, basically ensured that um, the building that was turned over to us um, was consistent with the design, which is a big part of this award, um, and exceeded every goal of the project. Um, she, in fact, worked some miracles on the project, you know, from a budget standpoint. Um, got us basically everything we wanted in the facility. Um, next, I'd like to bring up MCT general contractors, two of, the, um, two of their team. Doug Helms uh, was our project manager, and Nora Shepard is a president of MCT general contractors. Uh, the MCT team was able to turn this project around from design to construction finish in 14 months. And we didn't uh, suffer any uh, issues with quality, workmanship. Uh, it was top notch all the way through. Um, the Simpson Event Center was completed in June 2021 by MCT uh, after again a 14 month design and construction process. MCT um, and the architectural firm of Ted Richard Brown, who's not here tonight or able to be here tonight, were selected as our design build partners uh, on this project. We delivered this project as a design build project, one of the first for the uh, general uh, government for uh, Union County. The design process was comprehensive, uh, leveraged a lot of different user groups, a wide range of user groups. Two of the main uh, partner user groups were our Parks and Rec Department um, and our Agriculture Extension Department, led by Jim Chafin and Andrew Balkum. But probably equally as important uh, and valuable was input from some of our key community and agriculture interest uh, throughout the county. Uh, the input received from the Ag Advisory Committee, the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee, Livestock associations, youth agricultural clubs, public schools, and the broader Union County farming community was key in the development of the building use program that resulted in a functional design capable of supporting a wide range of events at the event center. Um, the broad and effective functionality of the building is being proven out right now, um, as in the first year uh, the uh, Simpson Event Center has been host of several successful events and reservations continue to increase and rise, you know, as we speak. Um, the building itself includes a 29,000 square foot open air arena, 12,500 uh, square foot indoor exhibit hall, 
features a large arena space, washdown racks, full view bleachers, large condition exhibit hall, auction platform, an extensive audio, visual, and public address system, concessions area, interior and exterior restrooms, as well as 6,600 square foot of permeable pavers in the parking lot. A well-rounded project, I'd say. Um, the project was awarded the Excellent Design Award in the agriculture category based on category that included the building specific use, unique features, products used, innovative solutions, challenges faced during construction, and sustainability measures. Again, I wanted to congratulate Linda, Doug, and Norris on receiving the 2022 Excellent Design Award. And I'm gonna let um, Doug, I think, want to say a few Good words. Sure. And then they've got a plaque to present to the chairman after, after he finishes. First of all, we'd like to thank the county for the ability to, to construct the project for you. And secondly, we'd like to thank Linda and Chris for their participation in the project as well. They were great to work with throughout the project. I've got a good team. Um, on behalf of MCT, we'd like to present a plaque that we get every year for excellent in design awards that we get. So we did receive one for your building. It's a national competition that we do every year, but we'd like to submit this to Mr. Rape, Chairman. Uh, I want to ask the manager something. If, if Commissioner Simpson will accept, I would like to acquiesce to you and let you go down and receive it. Because this is the man that brought the dream. Huh? That sounds good. Okay. Dennis, you said you knew Jerry 53 years. I thought you was going to say Jerry's been working on this for 53 <laughs> years. Close. <laughs> Did Miss Alexis Farmer just come in? Yes. Okay. Uh, since you got dressed up and came, we're, uh, we're gonna, we'd already voted on the proclamation, but you can come up and talk about it. Sure. Just state your name and which department you're with. Hello, so my name is Alexis Farmer, um, and I'm the Public Relations Coordinator at Pace of the Southern Piedmont. It's a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. Um, we're honored that Union County is recognizing September as Pace Month. Pace of the Southern Piedmont is a nonprofit organization that provides services to local seniors 55 and up, including an adult day center, medical clinic, social services, home care, transportation, and health education. We currently serve 180 participants in the area and have served over 515 since opening in July of 2013. PACE empowers seniors and their caregivers by providing flexibility in meeting a person's health care needs so they can remain living in the community. This month, we're taking the time to recognize the hardworking individuals on our staff who make everything we do possible. Additionally, we are highlighting our participants and their caregivers who have unique stories. Thank you for your continued support of older adults in Union County. 
Okay, and we have a plaque, if you'll come up here to present to you. Okay, now I would ask uh, Miss Liz Cooper, wait a minute, I jumped something, uh, Miss Beverly Lyles to come forward for the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Thank you, Commissioners. I'm proud to present tonight that the Government Finance Officers Association has awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting to Union County and the Finance Department for its annual comprehensive financial report for our prior fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. This report has been judged by an impartial panel to meet the high standards of the program, which includes demonstrating a constructive spirit of full disclosure to clearly communicate the county's financial story and motivate potential users and user groups to read our report, such as our investors. The Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting, and its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by our government and its management team. And tonight, I have several of my staff members here to join me um, to recognize them for the hard work and effort that goes into our financial report each year. Um, as you can imagine, there are a lot of hours that our staff spends putting this report together, not only for you all, but for our citizens as well. So if you would please come join me. Um, I have with us Heather Howie, our senior accounting technician, Trina Horn, our accounting services supervisor, Avery Kruko, who is our senior accountant and our certified public accountant on staff, and as Amy Hollingsworth is our assistant finance director as well. Okay, and I believe we have a, do we have a plaque for them, Ms. Clerk? Okay, if y'all will come around. Beverly, have you tried to get your staff to ride horses with you? I tried, but they don't, they don't want to. <laughs> okay, now, Liz Cooper, uh, National Association of County Achievement Awards. 
Good evening, Commissioners, Manager Watson. I am very proud to share the National Association of Counties, also known as NACO, has awarded Union County Government two achievement awards, as well as a Best in Category Award for innovative, effective county government programs that strengthen services for residents. NACO recognized the following efforts. Achievement Award in the category of Civic Education and Public Information for Branding and Website Redesign. Achievement Award in the category of Planning for the Union County 2050 Comprehensive Plan. And Planning Best in Category Award for the Union County 2050 Comprehensive Plan. So Lee Jensen, our Planning Director, is here to accept the NACO Achievement Award. Um, and my team with Public Communications is here, and I'd like to invite them up as well. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'd just like to say a couple of things. Um, I have a couple of, three of my staff members here as, as well, but um, before I introduce them, unfortunately, uh, Bjorn Hansen, who is our senior planner for long range planning, uh, could not be here tonight. He's, he's on vacation, but I want to give a little special recognition to him. Um, when we started this project, almost the kickoff meeting was almost, I think, three years ago. Um, He's a long-range planner, so he got the project, and if it weren't for his leadership and, and efforts on this project, I don't believe we would um, have, have gotten this award. So if, if Bjorn is listening to the meeting, um, Bjorn, I appreciate your, your efforts on this. He did a great job. Um, we also had 60 residents that um, participated on one of several coordinating committees. And I noticed that a couple of those folks are in the audience tonight. So if, if, if you're on one of those coordinating committees, would you please just stand up and, and be recognized? <laughs> and um, I have, again, my three staff members that are here. Matthew Ray, who is a planner in the long range planning section. Janet Wolf, who is a planner in the current planning section and Jim King who is uh, our senior planner for, for current planning are, are here as well. And, and lastly, I would just like to, to thank um, the board and Manager Watson and Assistant Manager Matthews for putting the faith um, in your planning department for allowing us to do this um, project. We um, did this completely in-house. I talked to Brian um, when we started this and I said, Brian, I think we've got the staff um, that, that here that are capable to do this and we did it. And as Liz pointed out, we won a Best in Category award for it. So um, I think you should be proud of those guys. Thank you. I'll quickly introduce my team as well. We have our branch manager, Brent Ayers, digital content manager, Aaron Steele, communication specialist, Nicole Horacek, senior communication specialist, Ethan Smith, and Chris Mumpower, our AV coordinator. You gotta come out for this one, bud. <laughs> We're gonna get a quick picture. Thank you. 
Okay, it's time for informal comments. And we only have one person signed up. I'm sorry. And who's right? You are. Okay. <laughs> okay, we have uh, Loretta Melicon. She's wanting to speak in informal comments. And you said my last name. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> uh, um, I felt called to be here tonight. And all I can say is this is such synchronicity, uh, serendipity. I don't know what words to use, but as Litter Queen and founder of Litter Busters, I was very involved with that visioning process for the Environmental Committee. Bjorn was fantastic in his leadership. Um, our final committee looked at ways that Union County could be forward moving in removing, getting rid of, at least mitigating the litter that accumulates here in the county. And as such, the suggestion that we made to the commissioners is to vote in a litter task force. Litter Busters has a small voice compared to the voice that you, our commissioners, can have with our citizens and the impact that you can make in the awareness. And um, we're asking that you look at our organization, our citizens' organization, as volunteers for your future litter task force. Together, we can do amazing things here in the county to get rid of the litter. And I thank you for trying to get this voted on before the end of the year. You guys have been through this process with us for the past three years. You are the ones together as this board who should be making that decision because things are probably going to change some after the election. And I hope you will be the ones to go down in history as creating the litter task force in Union County. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. Wait just a minute. Loretta. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I'm friends with Loretta as, yes. a, as though a lot of us are on Facebook. She is quite a woman. Uh, she had a, what did you do in your working life? I know I've seen pictures. <laughs> First, I was a wife and mother. Uh, then when my baby went off to school, um, I worked as a dental assistant. And then when my baby went off to college, I went to college and became a nurse. And now it's like the nursing career is over, I'm retired. I still have to be involved. I still have to make a difference. And when I moved off of Olive Branch Road, and that road was so heavily littered, I found out eventually it leads right to the landfill. And unsecured loads, those big waste uh, management trucks, it flies all over the place, in addition to people just tossing it out. I really have to recognize tonight the landfill they, in working with us and our organization, have realized that that heavy litter on Austin Cheney, which is in front of the landfill, and Olive Branch, which leads to Austin Cheney, are especially bad. And they have dedicated two of their landfill employees that go out every Wednesday and collect the litter along those roads as volunteers because they know it's because of them <laughs> there's all this extra litter. So, you know, it's just creating positive relationships which, with those who can be of service and we litter busters want to be of service to the county, but we need a bigger voice. Our little voices we have 700 members, but 
not all of them speak up. There's only a few of us that uh, keep well, coming in your face. <laughs> I'm going to put our very popular sheriff on the spot and ask him if he will set aside some time to talk with you about this task force. Oh, yeah. Is he here? Uh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sheriff Kathy, <laughs> you know me. We talk. But... Yeah, uh, and you know, we need to talk more, and he will definitely be part of this task force, but you guys have to vote it in. It well, I, let me tell you, you get with him, and anything he buys into, this board will usually support. Yes. So, we Sheriff can Kathy, do it, if. Sheriff Kathy. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Loretta. Okay. Liz, we, you, Patrick, you want to do the call in the act? Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's my honor to recognize the summer 2022 Caught in the Act recipient. Behavioral health therapist Courtney Jones is being recognized for securing a clinical assessment for a student believed to have homicidal ideation and engaging numerous community partners to ensure school safety. Jones regularly works in public schools as part of the Behavioral Health Collaborative. She completed a thorough assessment of statements made by the student and risk associated. She quickly engaged law enforcement, school administration, and counselors to collaborate and reduce risk. Please uh, help me in congratulating Courtney on the Caught in the Act Summer 2022 Award. Okay, now we will move on to the consent agenda, and I'm going to add one item to it, uh, EMS Agreement Extension Amendment. Uh, it basically authorizes the manager to negotiate and execute an agreement substantially consistent with the agenda item. Is there any other comments on the consent agenda? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay, on business, uh, going to recognize Chris Plate to start with, and then he's going to introduce his keynote speaker. And I tell you what, when Lee said that Pat Kale was involved in that, she is top notch. If you see her involved, it's going to be done right on time and all that. Um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, Manager Watson. Uh, the Monroe Union County Economic Development Board of Advisors is a 25-member uh, private sector group that advises uh, on incentives and other activities related to economic development. Uh, half of that board is uh, appointed by the City of Monroe City Council, and half of that board is appointed by uh, you. Uh, earlier this year, uh, the summer, they unanimously approved a resolution supporting the continued investment in infrastructure and other kinds of uh, uh, activities that would help support and further economic development success here in the county. Um, the resolutions that they passed along with the Chamber of Commerce's um, Board of Directors, it was a joint resolution, uh, touches on hard infrastructure like water and sewer, but also uh, workforce preparedness and also continued quality of life items. 
Um, this last fiscal year, uh, we had the best year in economic development in the history of our county, um, new capital investment as well as job creation. We had $342 million of new capital investment that came in. It's 520% of our goal and about 300% of our goal on uh, job creation at a, just under 1,000 people uh, that were announced. That does not count just the organic growth that was occurring as well among that group. As you can imagine, that um, to be competitive in this market, it took investments over the past you know, many years to, to position our county to, for that success. And because of this uh, past year, primarily, um, we have really thinned out the product that we have to sell. Um, and um, so due to that, we want to just keep encouraging the, to reinvest in ourselves so that we can remain competitive as we go forward in, um, in this fight for, for new projects to come in, for job opportunities, career opportunities for our citizens, and an opportunity for us to bring that capital investment that, at the end of the day, lowers our property tax. Um, so um, that's why, again, the Board of Advisors asked for this resolution um, to come forward to you guys. They've also reached out to the municipalities, and we have those resolutions, um, five of the resolutions from five different municipalities were passed, and we've handed those off to Ms. Lynn uh, for the record. And so, um, again, on behalf of the Board of Advisors, we ask you to uh, listen to Ms. Pat Kale as she's presenting from also the private sector and the, uh, representing the Chamber of Commerce here in Union County. Chris, you, your staff does a great job, and I'm so proud of the amount of growth we've had this year. It's just sad that Clemson can't follow through. In <laughs> we try. But again, you set a marker three years ago, four years ago, so I had to, we had to respond. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and commissioners and county manager Watson, thank you for this opportunity to be before you. The Union County Chamber's membership consists of hundreds of businesses employing thousands of Union County residents. Our mission is to champion business growth and business prosperity throughout Union County. Our vision is that everyone who does business or lives in Union County enjoys a thriving local economy and an excellent quality of life. Business plays a vital role in the economic well-being of our community, creating jobs for our residents, paying taxes that support the infrastructure investment, and enhancing the quality of life for all who live here through their support of local nonprofit organizations that serve the most vulnerable of our community. And we are blessed to have a strong, diverse business community. That community has been a catalyst for growth in good economic times and has softened the impact of challenging economic times like recession, inflation, recent supply chain issues, and yes, even a pandemic. The Union County Chamber has identified an infrastructure investment as one of the essential components needed for new business and industry development, as well as for existing business and industry success. In fact, infrastructure investment is of such importance to the continued economic health of our community, it is one of three focus areas of the Chamber's 2022 legislative agenda. I'm here tonight along with members of the Union County Chamber Board of Directors and Public Policy Committee to recognize the Union County Board of County Commissioners and local municipalities for past investment in the infrastructure needed to position our community for long-term economic success. To recognize the county staff and leadership for their role in developing and maintaining a positive, productive relationship with community leaders, including the chamber leadership, to develop and support continued business investment. And recognize the county manager for his ongoing leadership in developing business investment a qualified trained workforce, and a thriving community for our residents. As you heard from our economic developer, Chris Plate, the past infrastructure investments by our community have resulted in outstanding economic success. If Union County is to remain a community of choice for business and industry, new and existing, we must continue to intentionally plan and invest for the future. 
The Union County Chamber Board of Directors voted unanimously to adopt a resolution in conjunction with the Monroe Union County Economic Development Commission Board of Advisors to recognize these past efforts and to encourage expanded investment in necessary infrastructure, including water, wastewater treatment, and high-speed internet to support the continued business growth and business prosperity throughout Union County. A copy of the resolution from both the Chamber and Economic Development was provided. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, I believe uh, we have the Mayor of Waxhaw who's going to speak. Always a pleasure to have Mayor Pappas. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, County Manager, we also support the economic vibrancy of this county and of our areas. We have experienced a tremendous amount of growth over the last three years, at least that I've been in office, and we'd like to continue to have that investment in our communities to better and further support our tax base uh, and take the burden off of some of our residents. Uh, the town of Waxhaw, when I took office, had about a 93% residential to 7% other than residential tax base. And we have improved that a little bit. We're about 89.11 right now. We'd like to uh, encourage the communications, the efforts that we've had with all of our uh, relationships that we have here in the county. It's been a very, very good and cordial relationship building effort. And I thank you. County Manager Mark uh, to help us along with that process. Again, we, uh, we certainly further encourage all of you to pay attention to the investment that people in our community, the business community wants to make in our county. Uh, we know we have to manage smart growth along the ways, and so we wanna make sure that we can give you the support that you need as well. So I wanna say thank you, and I think uh, Mayor Horn would like to come up. Okay. Uh Ron, I do want to acknowledge before the crowd, Ron's also the CEO of CARPO. I'm the chairman of the CARPO, yes. Yes, and that's a huge honor, and they chose the right man. Uh, Ron is, he can get things moved along, if it can be moved along. So I appreciate your dedication to our transportation needs. Well, Thank we really do need to invest in that all along the way. It's tough. Uh, Craig and I were just at a conference this morning and talked about those issues, about the challenges that our state has in providing funding uh, for almost everything that we do. So I think that if we, again, uh, collaborate uh, cordially and uh, look at our common goals, I think that we will achieve them. So thank, thank you. you. Now we have Mayor Craig Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, members of the Board of County Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity just to make a couple of remarks along this way. Now, Weddington is not exactly Waxhaw. It's Weddington, as I painfully know, is not as aggressive in business growth and expansion as some other of our municipalities and other parts of our county. However, Weddington has its own needs. Particularly, we want to be able to provide services and amenities for our residents and the residents of Western Union County. And taken as an example, as you all know, we don't have a fast food operator. We don't have any of that stuff in Weddington. Well, we'd like a restaurant. Well, I spent 40 years in the food business. And I can tell you, I can't build a restaurant without sewer. I can't put a restaurant on septic. I'm also concerned about our growth in controlling our growth insofar as our housing stock is concerned. As you know, we get a lot of clay in Western Union County. I don't know how much more uh, septic that clay can soak up if we're gonna grow and continue to provide opportunities for people that want larger homes on larger lots. We've gotta have access to sewer and water to make sure that we get a broad, uh, that we get uh, our homes built on a solid foundation and they're gonna be there for for years and, and decades to come. I'd like to, uh, uh, Mayor Pappas mentioned that we had been at a uh, conference this morning. Uh, the South Charlotte Partnership had their annual transportation summit. 
two things came out of that. We all know about growth. We know we're growing like crazy. We're growing faster than pretty much any place in North Carolina, pretty much any place in the country. We also know we have a mobility problem, and I'm not talking about getting in the car and getting someplace as much as I am a, pro a social mobility problem. And one particular quote jumped off the page to me today. And it goes, travel time is the single biggest factor in families moving up the economic ladder. The longer the travel time, the less opportunity to lift out of poverty. Travel time is, so we need employment opportunities for our local citizens. We don't, our roads are overcrowded, we're trying to work with DOT to get them fixed, get new roads. We need local uh, employment opportunities and that's what uh, infrastructure investment brings to our, our county. And the last part I know, but it was sustained, this region, this region is gonna grow by 50% over the next 25 years, less than 25 years. We need the infrastructure to support our growth, our economy, and our, our citizens that live here now. And I appreciate very much your cooperation. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for coming, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> we also have some other guests in the audience that didn't want to speak, but they wanted to come to show their support. Dr. Brown from Wingate College, would you stand and let everybody? And Dr. Maria Farr from South Piedmont. Dr. Farr, stay up just a minute. I was informed Friday that you beat Patrick <laughs> on the longest drive. He was quite upset Friday, uh, and, and Michelle Lancaster beat him on closest to the pen, so. <laughs> but you know, when we laugh, you know, there's nothing wrong with coming in second. <laughs> board member Dr. Maria Farr, as well as Mr. Scholler, as well as Mr. Durham from Wingate University, and um, Mr. Griffin from Charlotte Pike. So thank, thank you. I still want to leave any of my board members out. Well, I figured uh, Mr. Scholler was here to uh, cover for Richard Long, who is on his way to Scotland. I wouldn't dare try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. Uh, Mr. Chair. We yes. need to vote on acceptance of the resolution. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I always do so good and then I forget one thing and it's like, okay, uh, I will make, Richard, I'll let you make the motion since you did the work. I, uh, I'd like to make a motion to accept the resolution as presented by the chamber and the economic development teams uh, for the success and future success of Union County. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And Commissioner Helms and Pat Kale and Dr. Farr and Ron and Craig and Dr. Brown and all your staff, Chris Plate, Lee Jensen, everybody in this organization, it just it's amazing. Uh, it's just amazing how everything falls in place for us, you know, but it's cause we got good people. Okay, uh, John Shutak, Shortline Water Extension Program, Evesement Acquisition. Me and John have come so far I'm proud of our relationship. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners, Mr. Manager, thank you for the time tonight. Um, today, I am going to be talking about 
the short water line extension program, uh, specifically about easement acquisition, and just a couple of housekeeping items on the ordinance as it relates to this particular program. So uh, for an agenda, uh, we're just going to be walking through uh, the easement acquisition process, what would staff do today, the challenges that we have with that process. I'll run you through an example that, that demonstrates those challenges, and then we're going to run through a few options uh, as well as the staff recommendation uh, that we're going to be asking you to act on. Uh, and I'll also be covering, uh, just like I said, a couple of housekeeping items on the ordinance. So starting off with easements, this is the, per the current ordinance language reads as follows. The extension must be able to be placed within a publicly maintained road right of way or it must be within a dedicated public easement providing ingress or egress for the lot to be served. This makes perfect sense. If we're going to be installing infrastructure, it's got to be someplace where the county can access it, own it, operate it, maintain it. So what we do as each of these projects comes along uh, is, first of all, we look at DOT right-of-ways. Uh, where are those? What are the limits? Do they exist? We identify all the properties that are going to need an easement. And then we put together the easement exhibits, the instruments, and we present those to the individual property owners so that they can be executed. And the important thing to note here is that compensation is not provided for these easements with respect to the short line program. And that's because folks are asking us to extend this infrastructure, so the expectation is that they provide the easement for us to put that infrastructure in. Well, we do have challenges with this. Uh, when rights away are not available and projects require easements from uh, all affected property owners, not just applicants but also non-applicants. And this is really kind of the rub. Uh, there's no incentive for a non-applicant to, de to dedicate an easement. They didn't ask for us to put the water line down the street in front of their house. Uh, but as part of this program, again, compensation is not provided. So they don't have an incentive and that's, that's where we run into trouble. So if the non-applicants won't dedicate an easement, staff's hands are tied. We don't really have a path forward to move that project along. So to contend with this, um, well, excuse me, before we get to the, uh, uh, the options, uh, this is kind of a, a good example of what we face. So what you see here in the graphic is we have a total of 13 properties that are affected uh, along the one and a half mile project length. Uh, and the properties noted in purple on the display there are the ones that we can't get an easement from the owners on. Uh, we've gotten nine of them, but we still need four. And without those four, we can't move forward with the project. And this is just, this is just an example. We run into this in many other situations as well. So how do we contend with it? Well, we've got really three options here. One, we can do nothing. Uh, but. That, that carries no benefit with it. There's no pros there. Uh, so the cons are, as I said, the project has no path forward, so ultimately we wouldn't be able to construct it. Seems counterproductive in, in light of what we're trying to do with the short line extension program. Option two is that we would provide compensation, but only for non-applicants. So the folks who didn't ask for the line to be there, we would offer them fair compensation for granting that easement interest. Uh, this carries a benefit as it incentivizes the dedication of the easement and it allows the projects to move forward. Uh, the downside to this is that applicants may look at this and say, well, wait a minute, you compensated my neighbor, why not me? So there's that, that communications piece that we would have to contend with. And then option three, excuse me, uh, would be to compensate all property owners, so both applicants and non-applicants. Non Again, it carries the same, per, same benefits as option two. Uh, however, the downside to this is it's the least cost-effective solution because we're paying somebody for an easement interest to put in infrastructure that they requested we install. And as I said, cost implications. Uh, so there are impacts to this. It's not an inexpensive endeavor uh, to acquire easements. We have services for an acquisition agent uh, as well as getting those easement interests appraised. And then there's the cost of the actual easement itself. Uh, 
and these numbers here that are provided on this slide, they don't contemplate costs for potential legal expenses that may be associated with this. Uh, if an easement acquisition has to be referred to outside counsel or internal counsel for negotiation uh, and settlement or uh, furthering, uh, furthering that acquisition process into condemnation. So as you can see here, option one, obviously there's no financial impact because we're not changing anything. With option two, if, if we're compensating non-applicants, you can see the, the net result here uh, when considering the, the backlog program or backlog projects for the FY21 year, uh, we'd be looking at roughly $275,000 to $375,000 total cost. Uh, if you were to look at option three for the same projects, uh, it's a little bit more expensive, uh, roughly three hundred fourteen to four hundred twenty-four thousand dollars. So about a forty to fifty thousand dollar differential estimated between option two and three. John, go back to that one a minute. Sir, Why are we paying for appraisal services if we've already established a four dollar and a quarter linear foot of easement? Uh, great question. Uh, that $4.25 per lineal foot is just an estimate based on a recent project, so it's meant to give uh, kind of a high-level overview of what that cost might be. Well, but we're going to we're we we spend almost $200,000 appraising it. Yes, that is correct. I mean, folks, don't, don't go out and appraise properties for no cost. So I realize that, but assuming we have to condemn it, it has to be appraised. Yes, our easement acquisition policy today requires us to do a fair market valuation, which involves an appraisal. Brian, will council have some opportunity to negotiate with the landowner? Certainly. It, so it, it follows the exact same process we did for the YAD. Before it goes to appraisal. No, sir. Um, it, our current process is that we do an appraisal first. From there, we have that discussion with the property owner. And, and that's, it, that's really designed for us to be able to have a starting point. Because ultimately, the appraisal is what we have to use if we do have to go to condemnation. Okay. Yes, sir. Good. So based on the three options and the cost implications of each, staff are recommending to move forward with option two. Uh, it allows our projects to move forward, so we have the, a mechanism to acquire those easements. It incentivizes those non-applicant uh, property owners to dedicate the easements. Uh, and as I said before, our applicants uh, who are choosing to participate in this program, they're already receiving a benefit, so we're, we're leaving them out of the compensation piece for this. Uh, and overall, it's just a lower cost impact. So we can put more water lines in the ground rather than spending more dollars on property acquisition. And for the edification of the public, there are some roads that have, are paved but have no right-of-ways. That is correct. So a lot when, of people I, when I walk know. through that staff process, uh, the DOT has either dedicated right-of-way or a maintenance right-of-way. When it's a maintenance right away, DOT will not allow us uh, an encroachment agreement uh, because it's essentially ditch line to ditch line that they maintain. But it's not, the property owners still own that property. It's not dedicated right away. So un unfortunately, we can't uh, piggyback on, on the uh, maintenance road right away. Okay. Yes, sir. You know, I look at this and I look at um, you know, the past 20 years in, in dealing with these issues and when it's a sewer line we don't it doesn't seem like it's been the same policy it's uh, you just pay a dollar a foot um, go out and go to court didn't care if it might cost 300,000 or a million or whatever we we would be presented with condemnations so this is really a, a public utility and a public use. Back then, that was the developer paying the bill. We were negotiating for it. But it was the developer that paid the bill back then. And we've been told, and I know Commissioner Helms and I both said at times, we've been told the developers were paying the bill on some of these and haven't been. Uh, so we look at this situation where I've had people calling me about this for, I think, a couple years now on that example you gave why would we not i mean and i'm i'm agreement with you on option two 
I wouldn't pay everybody on the road. You just have to buy the right of way. Sure. Uh, and but but again, I think there's a difference. In, you know, I see a difference, and it bothers me in sewer condemnations and even water condemnations sure. where it's not delivering product necessary to somebody's house. It's delivering it to another area, delivering somebody else's house then. But but we don't seem to have any problem with going through this process, and all of a sudden we got some kind of problem with going through this process. It seems like the process would have been simple and you wouldn't have had to bring it to us, is that we'd have gone in two years ago and said, we're coming through this road. We don't own the right of way. Here's the offer. You know, and then we'll present condemnation to the commissioners like we do in every other project. Sure. So, and and you're absolutely correct, uh, Commissioner Russing. The the board made a decision to change how we actually approach easements, and that was to, that actually dealt with the Yadkin project. And so we actually do use that same process for sewer lines as well as water lines now, because that was the process in which we went through um, that you adopted for Yadkin um, in the past. There was really no mechanism to, to say why this property owner's value was $1,000, where this property owner's value was 2000 And I think there might have been some concern that property values were a little bit um, skewed in some cases. So the board took a, a, made a decision that we use an appraisal, which is done by an outside agency, outside company, and that's the starting point for negotiation. So we're not the ones deciding whether your property's worth a thousand or yeah, and, and I got no problem with that. I yes, understand sir. exactly that process. It's just that, you know, these people have been waiting on water for so long. Certainly. And and I I mean I've even seen it where it was fast tracked at the last meeting of the Board of Commissioners before the next board took effect that uh, they were gonna condemn all these properties and it ended up costing us hundreds of thousands of dollars probably in court and in lawyer fees and in all this stuff for a sewer line right that went to a development um just one development to, to allow them Certainly. i'm just saying if these folks shouldn't have to wait so long if we go get the appraisal and it's thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars you know yeah. it seems like we'd be getting that information not well not making this decision right so unfortunately the the ordinance that was written for short line to understand that was a specific program for short line it specifically states that the right-of-way had to be dedicated. It didn't give staff the ability to even negotiate or, or pay. We literally had to say, you have to give us the easement. So we're, we're giving you that authority now? That's, that's what the request is, yes, okay. sir. That, that is why we're in this kind of predicament well, that we are so in So option right two covers all that? That is, that is correct, yes, And I would make the motion that we accept option two. Okay, okay any discussion? I'll be voting against it. Um, you know, I'm I'm troubled. There's already we know with the short line extension program an issue of free ridership, where non non applicants can eventually, you know, tap into the line and you know get to avoid uh, some of the expenses that good faith uh, applicants you know have already put forward. You know, and now we're deciding that you know we're going to compensate. Uh, non-applicants for an easement and you know down the road there's no obstacle to those non-applicants deciding to um, hook into the uh, water line to my mind that's adding insult to injury and it's kind of extending further financially uh, from I think where this program started which is I think probably at least one reason why the ordinance was originally written the way it was so um, I'll be voting against it. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, and I appreciate what you're saying there, but, I mean, those people that have been calling us for years begging for that water and wondering why they haven't gotten it yet, they see us condemning land and doing the same thing for people going through farmland, going through properties, uh, devaluing properties uh, of other citizens, and they just want water. They don't necessarily care how they get it right. and probably don't care that they pay a little extra for it more than than their neighbors do if their neighbors don't want it there is a there is a I guess in that in some parts of the county a, a thought process that well if we prevent this we can prevent development of some kind and and again these folks just want water I mean they, they, it doesn't matter to them 
and they don't understand why their neighbor, and so you, you don't want to pit neighbor against neighbor necessarily, but we do this all the time with sewer uh, coming down West Fork of 12 Mile Creek recently, for example. Um, people were, were contacting us, and this, this is prior to you coming on the board, about you know how, how do we stop this? How do we prevent this? And, and there really was no way to prevent it other than going to court and getting just compensation for your property. That was the only mechanism we had was the just compensation. Um, I don't know that there's a way that we can make these people. I mean, if, I imagine if we buy the easement from them, they are going to have to pay a tap fee and, and a system development fee if they ever intend to build on that property. Yes. So they'll have to pay the full ride for that if they build new homes. Yes, sir. That's, that's correct. There yeah. are fees they do have to pay in the future. So, Brian, Commissioner Russian is saying we don't condemn land for developers. Yeah, we, do. We, we do make condemnation requests um, for projects depending on the project. I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, in the past, there may have been projects that, that the board may have done condemnations for for development. I, I'm, I this wasn't board, part of that. Since I've been on it, we have not condemned for development. I, I can't say that the current board has, well, but well, I think in the past there may me, have been some. Let me some. explain that. Like, let's say that uh, like West Fork or 12 Mile Creek, there are developments along West Fork 12 Mile Creek that without our condemnation process could not go forward. And what happens is, and happened in the past, I don't, and what Richard and I were told in the past, I know we've been together in two on one meetings, where we were told the developer has to pay for those condemnations. And that's the way it's always been that I understood it. But then we found out that uh, the developers are actually not recompensating us for some of that. So like, if you're going from one point A to point B, and you have one neighbor down the creek that says, I'm not, I'm not selling you my land. There's a public interest, like a railroad track or a road, where we say, well, we're going to condemn. We can condemn. And no, I don't, we don't do many condemnations. But we can condemn that property. But the developer would ha or is supposed to pay that bill if it, if it benefits one development. And that, that's the way it's been in the past. And, and so we still do condemnations that benefit development on a bigger scale, which makes more sense like a road. But in this situation, all those neighbors down that road would benefit from this water and want that water and have, and have even paid for that water. But you got one neighbor that says no, or two neighbors that say no, I'm not selling my land because somebody might build a houses development here one day. Um, that, that's not fair to those people who have paid and, and stood in line and done all the work that we require them to do. And, um, and I, I just wish you'd reconsider, Commissioner Williams, because I really do think that the people who desperately want this water, I don't think they care necessarily. I, I appreciate that they want the water, but it's very important to understand that the county is not the obstacle to it here. You know, it's it's these property owners that won't grant an easement. And what we're basically deciding, entertaining as a matter of policy is that uh, it's okay for the county to subsidize and to buy you know, these easements. Um, and it's, you know, we already have a free rider problem. We know that with this program. And, you know, by paying for these easements, uh, we're just contributing to that. I mean, um, and, and we've, we've been told tonight that the expense might be more than this. I mean, what if some of these property owners decide, uh, you know, to not take our offer? Perhaps they want to, you know, uh, insist that we try to condemn the property. It's just uh, so the expense could be even, you know, higher than this. And I'm, you know, I'm just going to vote differently on this matter. And, and I appreciate that. And I would say that the difference is here is that, Time and time again, we, we, hear, we hear in close session with attorney's advice that condemnation is an option. Whether we choose to take it or not is irrelevant. It's an option. And, and these folks that, that um, refuse to sell their right of way, they are blocking their neighbors from getting clean drinking water. And you know when, when we use it for a sewer plant, for example, or when we threaten to use it for um, a water plant or, or water line, a big transmission line. We, we, we threaten to use it sometimes or, or it's a legal option, but here 
we haven't exercised that same thing to get water actually delivered to a house. You know, when, when we're talking about a transmission line or a sewer plant, it's okay to use it, but when we're talking about the individual benefiting from it, we're not okay with using it. I'm just saying all tools are in the toolbox. And, and um, I think if they go to them with option two, I think the people say, well, they're going to do it one way or the other. I, I, you know, I don't want to hire an attorney. I, I'll, you know, I'll work with the county. That's how it happens time and time again. That's how we want it to happen. We want those people. Uh, I neg I've negotiated several easements you know, in the past that, that the builder came forward and paid a lot more money than what they were uh, offering to begin with under the county's policy. And uh, one of those things is on Grassy Branch where we, we were negotiating two taps and, and now we find out we're over capacity there because the schools have grown. Not the neighborhoods or housing, but the schools have grown. Uh, so so it's, um, I think option two is a good idea. I think we need to use every tool in the toolbox and I think that's what you're, you're all asking for. And um, I, th I think you actually, that there's not a lot of these, right? Or there's several places on Union County roads we don't have easements. It, it depends on the project, yeah. to be honest. It, de it depends on the project, and, and we just know that in the future we will have these same circumstances we'll have to deal with where we can't get right away. Yeah. So, right. so having the ability to, to say when we're negotiating with the, the property owner that, hey, condemnation is a tool in the toolbox, um, we don't want to do that. We're, we're offering you this much per linear foot. Here's your appraisal. This is what we're going to give you, and they still say no. I mean, you just can't let those people go without water for, you know, ten years more, and and that money is allocated. Um, and my understanding is like the people on that example that showed had paid in money already, and yet their neighbors can hold up the whole project just by not wanting to let the water line go in front of their property down the road. John, would you go back to the map that showed where the problems are? And, and that's an example. I, I don't want to, yeah, that's just an example to show you. All right, but my question is, can we cross the road? Can we get on the other side of the road? Like we did with the Yadkin, can we back and forth? Chairman Rabe, I understand where you're going. Um, with this, the, the lines are placed where they're placed for reasons. I know, but so what I'm saying... In, in this, looking at this particular instance and the granularity and detail on it isn't going to solve the, the global problem that, right. we're, that we're going to run into because it's, it, it's something we're going to contend with, is, it, as uh, Brian mentioned, uh, this isn't a unique circumstance. There's right-of-ways all over the county that are maintenance only that we're going to try and run a water line down. Mm -hmm. and, and there are circumstances where sometimes we still can't put it in the right-of-way for whatever reason we may be dealing with. So it, this wasn't an, an attempt to get you to, to help solve Old Fish Road. It's really to solve the long-term problem of how do we handle where properties refuse to come in. And keep in mind, wherever you put it, one side or the other, every one of those property owners on that road aren't applicants. So we're gonna have a significant number of non-applicants that we have to deal with on every project. Um, unless, of course, you mandate that everyone participates, which you don't. So therefore, we're going to deal with non-applicants when we're do on either side of the road, they're non-applicants. We're gonna have the same situation. So this is about understanding the path forward you know, what do we do to solve these right-of-way issues? Okay. Mr. Chair. Mr. Commissioner Hale. I, uh, I, I will not be supporting it. Uh, I have a problem, and you made the point that yes, this is for the future. Yes, sir. So you're sending a message to other people. If I say no, I'm not going to allow you right-of-way, they're going to pay me, and then I can join on, and I just got my piece paid. That's I true. I think it's the wrong message. You're putting between two hundred and fifty and 500000 dollars for this we started at 500,000 when we first started the short line extension thankfully uh, the manager raised that to five million dollars and allowed us to do more I just don't think this is the right approach I understand okay we have a motion Commissioner Simpson Rush. I think Mr. Rushing was oh go ahead no you go ahead I've, I've spoken some yeah I, I would just say I've watched this program uh, develop over the years and uh, 
when I first got elected, that was one of the first requests I had down on Long Hope Road was the guy wanted water really bad. He had a terrible well. Uh, as the program has expanded, uh, the costs have certainly increased. Uh, there's no question we've had a discussion about our water system and the cost of our water and delivering water to our communities. Uh, what we have here is unintended consequences, and I certainly support um, Commissioner Williams' point. Um, I, I'm going to vote in favor of the motion because uh, I think there, there's people out there that need that water, and this will incentivize that. But uh, I would also suggest that we, we at this point, uh, before we continue to fund the short water line extension, that we look real hard at the program, the cost of the program, and if there are better ways to go about uh, some of the processes that we have. Thank you. Yes, sir. And, and I would say that there, there are some places where wh whether or not you've got a house there or not, you're assessed the, the, a fee for sewer and water availability. Um, I've, I've seen that on properties I bought where there was no water and sewer tap but the assessment was paid off as they ran it down the road. Is that familiar to, to either one of you? So I, I think, are you talking about the special assessment program? Because I, again, we- I, um, I guess it is, because it said assessment. Okay. Uh, for example, $5,000 or whatever our, right. whatever our, our um, fee would be per house. Certainly. Like so you said, you said that we don't require people that have houses. Well, if you build an additional house, you have to pay the, the if you have a vacant capacity. piece of property and you develop that piece of property after the water line is there, you'll have to pay a system development fee as well as you have to connect to the, to the property. If you're, right. if you're on a house with a well, um, depending on when that house was, was built, you may or may not have to pay a system development fee, but you obviously have to pay a connection fee, tap fee, those things. Um, I'll make a pitch for it, and I said this earlier before. Um, if the free rider program is a concern, and, and Commissioner Simpson brought this up about ways to think about the program, in the future, um, you can consider what's called a special assessment program. And the special assessment program essentially requires that a super majority of property owners have to agree that they're going to want this project. And when they say that, then everyone on that property, on that roadway, then are assessed and they have to pay. Whether they wanted to or not, they are assessed because they benefit from that. Um, that is a program. It does take a lot to manage, but it is one at which creates a little bit more equity in that all property owners are then responsible for the cost. And the county can certainly adjust that cost if you want. You don't have to make it 100%. You can make it some amount less than what the total cost is. But ultimately, that becomes a tax burden that the property owner has to pay as part of their tax bills. It's spread out over a number of years. And that's a way to, to make that more equitable. However, we don't do it that way right now. It is an applicant-based Whoever asks for it, if we get a score high enough, the board chooses to move the project forward. That's how the program works right now. So there are always ways to look at doing this differently in the future. We're only operating with the current ordinance the way it is. Okay. We have a motion. Will you restate it, please? Sir. Restate the motion, please. The motion is to accept staff's recommendation of option two. Okay. Uh, I've listened to y'all and it makes sense to me. And I've listened to Jerry and Stoney and it makes sense to me. So if you would amend your motion that it's only for this project and then let the new board decide it in the future, I'll support it. Um, can, I, is this can I ask for a clarification? Um, can we um, clarify that that's for the current um, uh, short line program, not just this one specific road, but for the current short line program because for there this are other year, projects. For yes, this year. This year, yes. Just sir. for this year. Yeah, that's what I'm asking for clarification on. And then let the new board decide how they want to do it. I, I just want to make sure that I understood what you were asking. I, I want to be very clear that this, this issue arose from addressing our backlog projects. So this goes back to FY21. 
uh, and carries forward. They have been calling me too. You know, they paid their money. I couldn't figure out. Uh, I, Brian found out this. Is, he first told me there was right of way problems. So, if you'll amend it, and then y'all can deal with it again in so December. The, the I think with John pointing it out, it actually would be any backlog projects as well as the current um, program. And, and, and I think that would cover it for now. Obviously, we would have to know what we're going to do for the 2023 Three. program. Do you need to know that now? And how time sensitive is this? They can't I, start I, on the, it. The backlog, we are, we are literally at an impasse with a number of property owners. I, I mean, for the future program, I don't think it's time sensitive. For for this year's program, as well as the backlog, it's time sensitive. That, that will carry past the new board being seated. Certainly. Certainly. So the projects that are in play right now? Yes, sir. That's what I think that's what Commissioner Rabe is, Chairman Rabe is asking for. Yeah, that would make the motion to say that. Okay, we have a motion to approve option two but it will be only for projects from here back and the new board will look at it again. All in favor? Uh, all opposed? No. I know John has got a, a few things on here. To, just for clarification, um, we still need to bring the ordinance back to you to adopt because it is an ordinance change. This was to make sure that you gave us direction. So we'll be coming back to you at the next meeting with the actual ordinance changes. We couldn't notice that in enough time because we needed to know which option you were going to select. So we will get the ordinance changes in front of you for the next meeting uh, and meet those notice requirements. And that, that is the official, what gives us the authority to do it, but this is what gets that ball rolling. And Brian, I won't be here, but we have got to get a program in place where these people that want water can ask the people on that road that don't, that we don't have a right of way to please help them out, you know. I understand, yes sir. But you can't make them. All right, it passed three to two. Thank but you for the direction. Uh, I, I do want to run through just, uh, in addition to the language regarding easement acquisition for the short line program, uh, we will be coming back with a couple of, as I said, housekeeping items uh, on the ordinance changes. And I uh, kind of had to chuckle a little bit because uh, the ordinance was originally written around a assessment method. Uh, and as we have worked through this over the last year and a half, two years, uh, we've come across things that were overlooked. Um, so we have a couple of text revisions to section 34, 452. Uh, and this is, these are really just remnants from the way the ordinance was originally written, uh, points of clarification. So rather than saying the estimated cost share uh, of each applicant's project is provided in subsection B will be conveyed to the applicant. We don't need to do that. We need to s simply state the cost share because we move to a cost share uh, approach for this. So the cost share uh, that must be paid by the applicant will be conveyed to the applicant as provided in section 34453. So these are really just cleanup items. So this is one of them. Uh, we have another one, uh, a few more sentences in this same section uh, that relate to moving from that assessment method to the flat fee methodology. Um, this particular one, uh, we needed confirmation to begin that assessment process. Since we're not doing that, we'd be revising this language. Additionally, we'd have a third component that deals with the easement acquisition policy. Do you need a vote on that, Sean? No, sir. This is just information only. We'll be bringing back just a couple of... And uh, in our meeting last Thursday, me and Chairman Williams, last Friday, I am starting to lean towards the assessment schedule too because the cost is just so high. But, and I, I have no relatives on Old Fish Road, but I have a lot of friends who have family members that are elderly and, you know, I just hope the water line gets in before they pass. All right. 
So you've already taken the board action that we needed you to tonight, uh, providing staff direction on easement acquisition. As Brian mentioned, we'll be coming back to you uh, at our earliest opportunity with those ordinance revisions. With that, I thank you for your time, and I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Thomas Mann, who is going to walk us through uh, well testing reimbursement. And I ask that this be put back on. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, at, at, at this time, it would be appropriate for you to read the motion at the bottom of the page so that we can begin taking up this matter. Okay. For, re for reconsideration of this item, use this following motion. Move that the board suspend the board's rules of procedure, including Rule 20, to allow for reconsideration of 2020, I'm sorry, 2023 short line, short water line extension program, well water testing reimbursement criteria, well water testing reimbursement criteria, and reconsider the well water testing reimbursement criteria. I guess it got hung up. And I just want to say something. We've got to vote on this. I, when I voted on this, I, as soon as I walked out of the courthouse, I just didn't have a good feeling about that, about how I voted. And so I asked for it to come back because I, I want to change where I voted. Okay, we have a, a motion to suspend Rule 20. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, okay. All right. Uh, commissioners, thank you for your time. As, as the motion uh, Chairman Rave just made, we're going to revisit the well testing uh, reimbursement criteria. Uh, just a quick summary of kind of where we're at now. Um, uh, back in June, uh, you approved uh, some changes to the scoring methodology for this upcoming year's program. Uh, we also implemented that well testing be required as part of the application and that some form of reimbursement uh, be provided to cover some of the costs uh, for the well testing. Uh, at, at the um, first meeting here in September, $100,000 of ARPA money uh, was appropriated uh, to fund the, the well testing reimbursement. And so basically going forward, uh, we're gonna revisit the, the uh, reimbursement criteria uh, for the board's discussion and approval. So um, just quickly, uh, the well testing that's gonna be required for the program is the bacteria test and the inorganic test uh, that inorganic test is going to cover your, your typical metals, arsenic, iron, lead, manganese, nitrate, about 15 other um, constituents that they'll be testing for. Uh, they're on the EPA's um, drinking water standards. Uh, from the last meeting, we basically kind of narrowed it down to two potential options on how we could do that reimbursement. I mean, there's a lot of different ways it could be done, uh, but through the board's discussion, it was kind of narrowed basically to either reimburse the selected applicants uh, after they've paid their cost share fees to confirm participation in that year's program, or reimburse all the applicants uh, that provided well testing as part of their uh, application for the program. Obviously, either option would start with this year's FY23 program that will start receiving applications for uh, on September 21st, which is this upcoming Wednesday. Uh, and then as far as the amount goes, uh, the recommendation was to limit it to uh, the, um, the fee charged by the county's environmental health department, uh, not leaving it open-ended to whatever the cost for an individual was if they had pursued uh, well testing from a, from a private lab, because that cost may be significantly higher, as we showed last meeting. Um, what we would ask there is that it be phrased to be the, the current amount uh, right now that would be $200, but if, if those fees go up, say next year to 225, 250, 300, then we would have the ability to reimburse up to that amount um, without requiring an ordinance change. So uh, what we're requesting action from the board on is either selection of option one or option two, uh, basically either uh, reimbursing the selected applicants after they've paid their cost share fee uh, in the amount of, of the current uh, testing fees charged by charged by environmental health or reimburse all the applicants uh, and limiting that reimbursement amount to the, the current fee 
uh, charged by environmental health. Commissioner Russian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I had voted if, um, for option one last time, and I, and I you, as well as Commissioner Helms and yourself. I've got no problem changing my vote. I think it was like, pause up anyways. What we were looking at was with, with people lining up for and getting well testing that we couldn't do it for all the people who really needed it. We were doing it for a, a great, could be doing it for a greater number of people, which could limit the actual needed applicants. I have no problem changing my vote. I'd ask Commissioner Helms, let's make a unanimous vote. And, and vote. I think I'll stick with my vote because I think it does open up the uh, situation where we mm -hmm. could have so many people just getting well testing that the people that actually need it we're trying to serve can't get on there because it's limited to 350, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. That, that's the, the, uh, the amount of well tests that the Environmental Health Department can, can perform over the application time period. And, and I'm not in disagreement with you, matter of fact, you know, we voted on it, but um, if it's going to be changed, if, if, you know, this is a test, it can be changed next year, right? Yes, sir. Right. So this Absolutely. is just a thing that can go from year to year. I mean, we, we just, we're trying it out to see what happens. And if, and if you feel uncomfortable with enough, I'm, I feel comfortable enough to go along with you on your vote. If you'd Commissioner like. Simpson. All right. <clears throat> I was a little bit like Commissioner Rushing last meeting. Uh, I really didn't see that it was a big deal, and I thought it would be it, it would be obvious. Uh, didn't speak out a lot. Uh, Commissioner Williams, for me, made the valid point that uh, the more information we have, the more we can fine tune our programs and direct the future. Uh, the other point that I thought about was, uh, you don't know who's you you don't know who we don't we do not know who's going to apply or how many are going to apply. And we shouldn't attempt to assume or try to estimate. We just develop the program, put it out there, and see who's interested. And for me, uh, the more information we have, uh, the better. And so I was I asked time in favor of option two and in favor of it again. Before I call, I'm going to make a motion for option two. But before I do, Thomas, I ain't no math expert, but two hundred dollars into a hundred thousand is five hundred. Yes, sir. The, the reason for limiting it to the 350, if you'll recall from the last meeting, that, that's our staffing limitation on what environmental health can okay. do. Um, but you could always uh, make your motion to, to allocate the full you know, $100,000. That would just mean 150 of those well test results would have to be performed by outside laboratories, most likely at a significantly higher cost to the applicants than if they did it through environmental health. And if, of course, this will be the new board of who three of these members will be on there. If a bunch of people start coming in and having good whales tested, they know they've got good whales, so you can deal with it down the road. But I'll make a motion to go with option two uh, to reimburse all applicants. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Right, and I respect your no vote. You know, I talked to you about it. Oh, yeah. That's fine. It just bothered me. Uh, all right, county manager, comments. I have no comments this evening, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Helms. I'd like to uh, thank our many citizens that came tonight in support of the resolution of support for continuing development of county and municipal infrastructure to sustain economic investment, workforce development, and preferred quality of life in Union County. Uh, we had a significant, our audience was very, uh, very many of our distinguished citizens uh, were here tonight to support this. Uh, I found it interesting that Mr. Plate said that this year we had such good economic development that we brought in 342 million of new commercial. What he failed to tell us is that we have averaged a thousand job growth per month since last December and it's taken us down to a 3.2 unemployment. Uh, I just want to thank them for coming and taking their time and having their interest in Union County to make sure that we continue to be the prosperous, uh, high quality of life county that is so attractive to others. Thank you, sir. Vice Chairman Williams. Uh, I'll be brief. I'd just like to echo Commissioner Helms's comments and 
uh, thank all those um, stakeholders that showed up tonight and spoke in favor of the resolution. Um, yeah, it's important. I mean, infrastructure is important. Um, you know, we all know that uh, we have um, actual and, and uh, committed flows at 12 mile that are bumping up against 99%. Uh, we know that at uh, Crooked Creek, that even if we were to act today, we would still uh, reach a situation where we're bumping up against 99% uh, capacity. So if we want economic growth to continue, if we'd like more commercial development, if we'd like to diversify our tax base and uh, eventually get to the point where uh, a lot of that burden, a lot of that load is uh, lightened for us residential taxpayers, uh, then, you know, putting our muscle into uh, infrastructure is important. And this commissioner's prepared to continue to do just that. Thank you. Commissioner Russian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to congratulate the Union County Sheriff's Office on the investigation and arrest uh, this uh, past week in the Unionville area on a drug operation. And, and after watching or hearing about that, I went, I actually was doing some research and I looked at the city of Seattle and there was a program on, on YouTube about the city of Seattle done by a local news agency showing the drug problem that they have there in the tent cities and the, and the defecation in the streets and drug use in the streets and all the problems that they were having in Seattle and how they were trying to fix that. And I know we don't have the same necessarily issues here as there. And we're, we're very fortunate. But we do have uh, drug issues in, in our county. And uh, I look forward to working with the Sheriff's Department on that in the, in the coming years. Um, the city of Memphis, uh, Edwin Elam, you know, we spoke a lot about the city of Memphis. And it's sad, it's now deemed one of the most dangerous cities in the country. Um, and again, these, these drug issues, these uh, crime issues, you know, if you put up with a little bit of it, you get a lot of it. And so thanks, thanks to the Sheriff's Department, the job they do. And again, hope to continue uh, fixing a lot of these drug issues and homeless issues with uh, Union County in years to come. Thank you. Commissioner Sampson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just like to uh, once again congratulate those staff members uh, uh, who were involved and for those awards. Uh, I was a department head once and you always get information across your desk about there's an award for this, there's an award for that. Uh, well, guess what? If you apply for that award, our staff members, they have to do the work and it's above and beyond their call of duty. And so uh, I uh, certainly congratulate you on taking that extra mile and uh, receiving those awards. Uh, the other thing I'd comment on is to say a hey, God bless and a thank you to Courtney Jones. Uh, you know, we, uh, we hear these incidences uh, quite often uh, that occur in our schools and our troubled youth. And there's kids out there who, uh, who need help. And uh, that is often and usually the source is mental uh, health issues. And so I just thank her for that. Uh, that means so much and there's uh, uh, more we need to do. But I thank this board for the efforts that we've made and thank her for that. Okay, I would just like to thank everybody, all the staff that's here of the organization and tell the ones that are not here, you know, it's, it's certainly a privilege to serve on the board of an organization like this. I know most of y'all by first thing, uh, Ashley, I don't see how you get all you do done. It seems like to me you and uh, Beverly must transport like with a Star Trek thing because you'll be here at 5 and then at 6 or somewhere else. And so y'all are certainly active. Uh, Liz, I thought about the baby, your baby, uh, all weekend because I'm a channel 9 watcher you know how you're raised you watch which channel your parents did and a lot of your old co-workers they've had babies too and so you sort of started a trend I know Gina Esposito and uh, Allison Lato so good for you and uh, 
I really appreciate all that staff does. Make a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye.